Thank you all for coming today. Uh, I'm going to introduce John Elder. John leads America's most experienced data science consultancy, um, Elder Research. Um, they were founded in 1995, and they have offices in Virginia, D.C., Maryland, and North Carolina. Dr. Elder co-authored three award-winning books on analytics. Um, he was a discoverer of ensemble methods. He's chaired international conferences and is a popular keynote speaker. He's an occasional uh, professor of systems engineering at uh, UVA and was named by President Bush to serve five years on a panel to guide technology for national security. So with that, I'll introduce John. He's going to talk a little bit about AI and hopefully tell us where the markets will be in the next couple of weeks. That's impossible. Yeah. Thanks, John. Thank you. Your phone is right here. Uh, thank you so much. It's an honor to be, be here today and share this yummy lunch and talk with y'all. Uh, I think this is my second time. Um, probably no one from that first time is here, which is probably why I was invited again, but anyway, no. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> Good to see you. Um, I want to talk about so many things and uh, just have a little bit of time. And uh, so let me give an overview of what it's all about first, and then hopefully that'll, that'll help with the digestion of things thrown at you fast. And I apologize for interrupting your lunch. So it's, it's a good one. Um, the heart of science is discovering things, and, and every field has data. And there's this new field called data science, and I don't really like the name. I like data mining better because mining analogy is a good one. You're trying to find stuff in data. You're like hacking into rock. You're not guaranteed to find anything, but if you do find something useful, it could be really valuable, like oil or gold or something. But the data science thing is is an interesting name and you know if someone's doing physics experiments they're collecting data and trying to infer something from that. If someone's doing biology experiments or pharma pharmacology discover a drug or something like that it all comes down to data and most scientists aren't expert at analyzing data. They're expert in their, in their field and so they use these magical formulas to see if because you find something it could be luck. That's the key concept from statistics. <laughs> and the statisticians develop these tests to, to say, how likely could the thing you have found have arisen by chance? Or well, not that thing, but something that interesting. So that particular thing might be extraordinarily rare, but something that caught your eye with as much weight as that could be very common. Like, uh, an example is someone won the state lottery in Ohio twice. And so articles were written about the chances of this were more than there are atoms in the universe, you know, when actually it's not. You know, the only, interesting, the only reason it's interesting is because she won the first time. So the question is, how likely is Sybil Brown to win the lottery a second time? Okay, so that already cuts, takes the square root out of the big number. But it's even, it's even more interesting than that because it doesn't matter if it's Ohio or Florida or California or... You know, there could have been a lot of different uh, that would have caught your attention. By the time you take everything into account about what would have been as newsworthy as that you know, with having to do with lotteries, the chances are about one in three that something like that would happen this year. So, you know, the, the intuition we have about how unusual something is or how, what an amazing coincidence uh, is is not good because there's so many ways things can be interesting, so many ways that things can be unusual. So you're gonna hire, hire a stock picker during this time. And so you see how they've done for the last 10 years or the last 10 months or, or whatever, and you hire, you, you interview several of them, maybe five, six, seven, 17. Well, if you just do an experiment with flipping coins, heads or tails, you know, what's the chance that the best flipper of coins would give you something that you'd think was interesting, like eight out of 10 heads? But wouldn't eight out of 10 tails also be interesting? <laughs> we'll hire them and just do the opposite of whatever they say. You know, there's just so many ways, or if it was head, tails, head, tails, head, tails, we would always, we could see something in the market. So the talk today at, at, at the heart of it is about 
what do you do? How can you tell if you see something and it's interesting, or if you searched for something and is it, is it interesting or not? So that's what it's all about. So data science is enormously powerful. Uh, we've used it to help discover a drug. We used it to save the U.S. government and us taxpayers $20 billion by finding fraud in the earned income tax credit uh, thing. We've, we've helped to predict three to four months ahead of time what oils are going to freeze and stop uh, producing natural gas in the northwestern U.S. We've uh, done a lot of anti-fraud work and other kind of anomaly detection or resource prioritization. If you think about it, you have a bunch of investigators, you have a, a sea of possibilities that you want to look into. If you can have the computer trained on past examples of fraud or non-compliance, score everything you haven't looked at. And then that prioritizes you as the expert to look into it and figure out the subtleties. And even if you can go further than that, and now once you have the answer, feed that back into your database to improve the model that's doing the scoring. So you want to have positive and negative examples and then tell the computer, okay, give me a formula that predicts this is a one and this is a zero, or as close as you can, and see if any factors pop out. It's enormously powerful. We used it for a lot of things. Our company's in the 27th year, about 120 people, which is a small company, but still, it's a consultancy, so uh, we, we help our clients have enormous return on investment. They don't always pay us uh, well enough, but um, we've somehow survived through the uh, various ups and downs. And the really cool thing is you're solving a puzzle, and this is, uh, this is how we feel, right? You know, this, there's this challenge, nobody's been ever to, when we solved that uh, oil and gas well prediction problem, they said four other companies had failed at that. So, you know, that's how we see ourselves. And I've come to learn that this is really more how they see us. So, <laughs> hey, there's some data over here. You know, this looks pretty good. Hey, guys. So anyway, uh, it's a little, it's a mix of both. It's a, a tiny bit glamorous and a lot of scrambling around in trash cans. But uh, so uh, uh, that outline, again, we have a powerful ways of finding things in data, but you can find spurious things, so spurious correlations, things that just happen to be lined up by luck. And that's the greatest strength and greatest weakness of data science. Um, in fact, all of science is in crisis because of that, because there are much more powerful tools now for looking at data and looking for patterns that you can always find something. Uh, and I'll have, it's, it's rather disturbing, uh, but just basically most published papers in scientific journal articles in every field are false. Yeah, I know that's a really wild thing to say. I'll give a little evidence for that. This just tells you the seriousness of the problem. And by false, I mean it can't be replicated. If someone does the same experiment with new patients or new uh, companies or new whatever, it doesn't work out most of the time to be anything like the published experiment. So this is, this is pretty extraordinary. Uh, now, half of that problem is technical, is how to analyze data. That half we, I've solved. So I'm going to tell you all the brief, brief outline of that. Um, and that's why I speak about this whenever anyone lets me, because it's so important. You know, if we can find a way to know if this treatment is really good for cancer or not, that makes a big difference. It makes a big difference in every field. So I'll use two examples. I had, had more in mind, but with just the time I have, I thought, well, I'll use two. I'll talk, start with the market timing hedge fund that we did 25 years ago till 15 years ago that worked really well. And uh, target shuffling, this technique for telling how good something is, helped me convince the client that we had something real. And then it helped us decide when the edge disappeared slowly over time, when to get out. And it closed out, everybody got their money back and more. Every, every investor came out ahead. That's not the normal way the hedge fund shut down. So we're real proud of that. And then even more important problem, baseball. Okay, so, all right, so here we are. Uh, there's a spurious correlation, it's one of my favorite. 
if you see those two graphs, the red is the number of people who drowned by falling into a pool, and the dark is the films Nicolas Cage appeared in year by year. This man is dangerous. He needs to get out of Hollywood. So, lives are at stake. Okay, so, and then here's one that's maybe a little less serious. Uh, worldwide non-commercial space launches have something to do with sociology doctorates awarded in the U.S. It's unbelievable, uncanny. So anyway, if you, this fellow, Tyler Vigen, just collects data one point per year on lots of different things, runs it and, you know, creates a, he got a book out of it. So pretty cool, pretty cool gig. But it just, um, there was a paper once published about how the price of butter in Bangladesh would predict the S&P stock market for the next year. And the author was trying to say, see how ridiculous this is, you can't look at these things. For years, people were calling him up, asking him about butter prices, <laughs> so it, it didn't quite get across. But anyway, so this, uh, this is the result of an experiment, actually a hundred different experiments of psychology, pub the most famous papers from 2008 in psychology, uh, seven years later, were replicated or attempted to be replicated by teams of people. It was led by a psychologist at the University of Virginia. He coordinated uh, these hundred different teams, or almost hundred different teams. Um, and if something had a strong effect size on the original paper, that would be the x-axis. And the effect size on the replication is the y-axis. So you kind of would want things to be around that 45 degree angle. That would mean like it was predicted to do about this well. Somebody tried it again and it did about that well. But you can see that the red ones are the ones that were considered failures that did not replicate. And in fact, only 36 out of 100 replicated. And this is the cherry-picked result. These are the top papers, the most cited papers from those few years. In fact, the person running the experiment, his experiment, that didn't replicate. And the interviewer, there's an NPR, if anyone's interested, I'll send you a link to an NPR audio show about this. They asked him, well, how, does that mean yours is false? He's like, no, no, I'm too invested in it. <laughs> so, so the guy who did the whole study, but this study won the science uh, result of the year from Science Magazine, and it's a great, it's a great uh, project. It just shows, and so some people say, well, psychology, that's a soft science. I can understand why only a third of those would work. But if you look across lots of different fields, this is, a, this is a different result. It's not exactly the same. What this is asking is, have you failed to reproduce one of your own experiments, or have you failed to reproduce somebody else's experiment? Failed when you tried to reproduce, it failed. And you can see that the you know, big majority in every field have had both of those problems. Now, it doesn't say anything about what proportion of experiments. So that's a, it's just the existence of one that didn't work for you. So that would, you'd, you'd think that would be a higher number than the, the proportion of ones. But the problem is, yes? You also find it interesting that, if I'm reading the, the lower bars, that people fail to reproduce their own experiments at lower rates. Yes, so like, yes. Kind of mine's are mine's are, mine are good, but okay. other people's. That's a, it's an old trick in, uh, in, psychology, in, in sociology is, if you want to know, like, how recycling adherence or any, any kind of approved behavior is done, you can ask the person and you'll get an inflated number. And then you ask about their neighbor. And that will best reflect not the neighbors, but theirs. And they, they tested that by, by, by being a, a, a trash can panda and going through, you know, being a raccoon and going through the trash of people after getting how they thought about, re and then looking at their trash to see how much they actually did recycle. So anyway, it, it's, a, it's a useful trick to use. Okay, so you can think of a journal article as a recipe. Here, I did this experiment and I set it up this way and I got these results. And the fact that you're getting such different results when replication comes, I don't know if anybody here has an account on Etsy, there's this phenomena called nailed it, okay? Somebody has a, a, little, uh, a little cake they've made with a, movie character and a little minion and then somebody tries to follow it and they're like nailed it you know this <laughs> this is this is how I picture the state of US research but anyway or worldwide research or there's some Easter peeps nailed it you know 
Maybe, maybe not. Uh, a great, cute Christmas decoration idea just doesn't come off as, as originally <laughs> scheduled. So this, you know, that's how I see U.S. Uh, how I see worldwide the research issue. And I wasn't aware of its depth. The, the, and we have higher, a lot of clients have we noticed the problems with their work, and we try to help them with it and give them good best practices and so forth. But I didn't know how widespread it was until this article. I was in the London airport and I picked up the Economist magazine with this fantastic title. And um, this is uh, from 2013, so almost 10 years ago. And it had a lot of examples in it. It's great. Uh, these are still available on the web. Um, these articles, or if anybody wants them, I can send them. Uh, and so I, I gathered together from that article and from others th some examples about how widespread this problem was. So 90% of scientific research, if you ask them, believes there's either a strong or a moderate crisis in terms of science being trustworthy. The, rep, the experimental science being trustworthy. So they believe there's a crisis. Uh, British Medical Journal, one of the top medical journals in the world, uh, all of their, all of their re, uh, reviewers f failed to find all the errors in some of the uh, things. They, they, they did a cruel thing. They created a paper with intentional errors and gave it to all their reviewers and scored them and calibrated how they were doing. And it was much worse than they thought it was. And that's our main protection against problems is other people in the field reviewing the papers and making comments and asking questions. But it's, a, it's, not, a, it's not a great protection. Amgen has a, a business built on 53 different research results. They spent millions to replicate those results themselves as a check and only were able to replicate 11% of them. Bayer the same thing a little bit better, 20, 25% of their 67 foundational uh, things that they're relying on, whether they or somebody else discovered it, they've got business relying on those studies. The Lancet's another top British medical journal. They only take 5% of the papers, but they themselves said in an editorial that I read that they believe 50% of what they publish is, is worthless. They just don't know which percent, so it's like marketing. <laughs> So that's a good question. Is there a selection bias? Um, they believe that the 19 they rejected were more worthless. Um, of course, there was self-selection in who submitted papers in the first place. So if you think about all the research done, a very, very tiny proportion of it is selected by these top journals. But even the top, you'd think maybe the biggest proponents of the journal experience would be the publishers of the journal, and they say, oh, yeah, we believe half of what we've got is bad. Now, that's the underestimate. That's the lowest estimate. Half is bad. That's the lowest estimate. John Ioannidis, who's a PhD, MD, most cited doctor of all time, did a huge and influential uh, paper on how most research results are false, and he himself believes only about 10% are true. Yes, yes, yeah, that's a great question. He has a lot of different ways that things can go wrong, and he also scores the likelihood of things being wrong. And one thing that makes it wrong is if it's a hot field, if it's a new field, there's only a few people in it. Those, so there are all these things are kind of, they kind of make sense when you stretch it out. And then, oh, also if there's a lot of financial incentive for positive results, that improves, that makes it worse to b believe the positive results and so forth. So. Lots of, there's lots more under the hood to, to look into this. I think the big shock is, wait, you're telling me most research articles are false, having to do with the analyzing data. Um, and here's one of the reasons why. I don't know if you're all familiar with the XKCD comic, but this is a brilliant guy who can explain a lot of subjects uh, with these, he's a horrible artist, but anyway, uh, his little stick figures. Um, so someone has the hypothesis that jelly beans cause acne. And so they come, they come running, and uh, the scientists investigate, and they come back and say, no, we found no link between jelly beans and acne. There's a p-value greater than 0.05. Now, the p-value is supposed to be the probability at, at this stage of something happening by chance. So they're saying that the, we found no link, and if there was a link, then there's only a 5% chance that it was there and we didn't find it. That's basically what they're saying. <clears throat> now, that is true if you're trying one thing. 
let's imagine rolling a die. If you, if you have a 20-sided die for Dungeons and Dragons, let's say, and you roll it, what's the chance that 20 is going to come up? 5%, right? It's an even, fair die. But people don't stop with one roll, right? So that's, and this person doesn't stop either. But if you rolled several times and got the cherry pick your best result, the chance of a 20 is much higher, right? And so what's happening here is they, the person doesn't stop. All American ingenuity, we're not going to stop with one failure. Like Edison, right? He tried a thousand different things, filaments for his light bulb that didn't work. And somebody's asking, trying to commensurate with him on his failure. And he was excited. It's like, I made so much progress. <laughs> you know, I know this is going to work. Somehow he knew it was going to work. And I've already eliminated a thousand possibilities. You know, so that's sort of the mental ideal that we have. So we're not going to stop there. What if it's color? And so one by one, all the different colors are tried, brown, green, yellow, blue, teal, and all of those cells have the same disappointing result, except one. We get green jelly beans and acne. Whoa! Next day, green jelly beans linked to acne, 95% confidence, only 5% chance of coincidence. Again, that was right if you t did it one time. You tried one idea, but you tried 20 ideas. So you rolled 20 die. What's the chance of getting a 20? If you roll 20, it's not one, but it's close to one, right? So maybe like 90% or something like that. We can figure it out, but I won't waste your time. Anyway, uh, this is what's going on. This is the main problem is this sort of multiple comparison effect. So somebody does, say they're doing an experiment and they're going to roll a die and they want to get a seven for, for craps with two regular die. And they do experiment, they don't get it. They stand on one leg and try it, okay? Now they do it with the air conditioning off. Now they do it with the lights off. Now they do it left-handed. Now they toss it this way. Eventually, they're going to get what they're looking for, and so they're going to write that up. That's what you do. That's a very cartoonish version of what the experiments. But people don't realize they're rolling dice. They, they think it actually was the, the ultraviolet light that they shone on it, or the, the degree to which they heated it first, or whether they pounded it flat or not. You know, they're doing physical things to it, and that's what we want to explain the results from, instead of realizing that chance is pretty powerful, especially if you cherry pick results, right? Okay, so I wrote it up first many years ago. That actually got, that book uh, was all about data science, actually got Book of the Year in Mathematics. I think it's because it had four colors. I don't think, uh, <laughs> I don't think that, was the, that was the secret. Um, but the first place I used this idea for how to correct for this was with a hedge fund. Now, I know you guys are going to really want to know everything about the hedge fund and nothing about this whole other idea. But the, what we were doing is we were trading, and this was uh, mid-94 to mid-95. These are actual live results of live money trading. Um, we, uh, we got asked to help somebody with, with an idea that might work. I was able to show that, yeah, it works great. And um, can I start trading it? <laughs> you know? So I started trading back here. But the client didn't put money in until mid-94. And I put in my entire life savings of $40,000. And my wife, hers, of 20000 That's the miracle, as Frank, Frank knows. That's the miracle that my wife put money on, one of what she called, she finally called my cockamamie scheme. So, uh, and then the client eventually put pocket change of his $2 million in, in this day. Now, we lost him $4,000 the first day, so we didn't talk to him that day. But uh, the green line is, is his balance uh, over the year, and we're trading once a day, or not trading. We could go long or we could go flat. We couldn't short. This is a basket of highly volatile stocks in one sector. And for a while, the, the, that sector was doing great. And all of our trading was doing worse. And he's like, why am I paying you guys to lose me money? I said, well, we'll pay off when it starts coming back down. Because we, we were out of the market 60% of the time. We were only in the market 40% of the time. So roughly two days a week we'd be in, three days out. And the whole question was, what days? And over the course of the year, there's about 250 trading days, or about 100 days we were in the market, 150 out. And yes, that's what happened when it started going down. We were able to miss most of that down and kind of go up. But there was very volatile times. It was very scary. And when the thing was all done, we were like, this is a big success. Let's get clients to pay, put money in, and take fees. And he's like, no, I'm dead. I'm dead. It's too scary. It's too bad. It's like, whoa, what are you talking about? This guy has an MBA from Harvard. He has a 
engineering degree from Texas A&M. He's, he's rich, but I think rich people like to stay rich. I think is what I've determined. Anyway, uh, but he didn't see that this was really a good system. Now, the I think I have some of the sharp ratios and things on there. Yeah. So the buy and hold thing was down 11% with a sigma of 26 for a negative 0.6 sharp. Our thing had a up 27%, so it's almost 40% better with half of the volatility and a one and a half sharp. So like, it should have been a no-brainer to go into, but it wasn't a no-brainer because he had lived through this, what I call third world roller coaster. <laughs> a hedge fund's like riding a roller coaster in the third world. You're not sure you're gonna survive the experience. Um, and he was just shaken from it. Um, so I came up with a, a different way to explain it. Cause you know, you use t-tests and so forth, but statistics is, is, is the worst caught material in the university. I was teaching data science to a bunch of statistics professors and they didn't like that when I said that. I think part, some of them heard taught. That's true too sometimes, but you know, if you, if you probably had that one statistics course in business school or something, that, it's probably a very painful, a painful experience because it's kind of like Buddhism, you know, this alternate world, but now you do this integral, you know, so you're considering these, this range of possibilities and these alternate circumstances and you have to do this horrible math, but there's a better way to do all that. See, all the statistics was, was uh, invented by geniuses, poor mathematicians to help rich gamblers. <laughs> so all of it was originally cards and dice. And if you go back to that simulation and with that, that works better. So what I did here is I said the timing is what's the important thing. And how significant is this result? How likely could we have gotten this result if it was by chance? Let's find out. I'll try a thousand different timings. So I'll just randomly shuffle the hundred ones in that 250 spots of days, trading days, okay? I don't want to randomly choose whether it should be a one or a zero because some days will have, some years in simulation will have more in the market, and some fewer. That's, that works fine, but mentally the fewer things you change the better. So here I'm just going to change the timing. What am I testing? The timing. So what should I change? The timing. How important is the timing? How, how likely is the timing? Is it 20% of the time that random will beat? 5% of the time? 30% of the time? That will tell us something really valuable. So when I did the experiment and ran it, uh, only 15 of the thousand uh, shuffled timings were better. So you just answered the question, how likely is it could I have gotten something better or something more interesting by chance? When the timing came from chance, 1.5% of the time it beat the real result. There's your answer. And it's not involving any integrals or you know, fancy formulas that we have an intuition is, are wrong anyway because we you know, tried a lot of things. Now this can work, this doesn't work with a back test because with the back test you're searching and searching and searching. This worked with an actual result. So you have to do something fancier and harder that I call deep target shuffling when you're evaluating back tests from your careful study of previous data before you make a decision whether to put real money with it going forward. Uh, and that's another, that's topic for another day. But anyway, uh, it's along the same lines. It's just, it's just a lot harder. You have to include the simulation search process in your experiments. Okay. So he then put $20 million in and started inviting family and friends and contacts and so forth to invest. And ultimately, I had, we had a system that ran for about 10 years. These are the last eight years of it. Um, some of the early years were really good in terms of return, but um, fewer investors and so forth. So on a log scale, this is the, the hedge fund in purple and the S&P and the Russell in the other colors. You can see that it made money every year till the last year. The last year it lost a little bit, but a lot less than the, than the indexes. And, uh, but our edge was disappearing and it was shut down. So uh, at target shuffling, the same, the same technique was used to say, well, to what degree do we have an edge? You know, how likely is this, this this result that we've been getting explained by chance. Uh, all right, so uh, let me go to another class of problems in that, in that vein of, you know, how likely could this be by chance to see that there's 
lots of different ways you can use it. If you're looking for a hotspot, some people call it data cubes, where you may have a bunch of customers or something and you slice and dice them, well, not them, but abstract representations of them, into, into little boxes. So you put somebody in a box about their age, their geography, their gender, you know, that sort of thing, and you say, oh, these are the people that really like to buy this product. Uh, we've done this little segmentation. Okay. Well, if we just randomly threw things into that box, you know, kind of darts or colored pieces of, of uh, Play-Doh or something like that, you know, they're gonna s some, there's going to be a cluster somewhere. So that's the idea we're going to use to try something out and to get that result. Let me shift to a second chart here, and we'll, we're almost, we'll have this one experiment left, and then... Um, and then we'll conclude here. Let's see. So what I want to do is show you baseball. This is um, a strike zone. Uh, and the, the reds are hits. So the horizontal position of the strike zone and the vertical position. And then the, the third dimension is velocity. See, it's almost like the, the depth of the ball at a certain time. Uh, and there's, there's no distinguishing here between curve balls and, and sliders and all things like that. Uh, we don't know if the batter or pitcher is right-handed or left-handed, but these are all the pitches that were thrown on June 1st, 2013. Just grab that data. And 9% of them are hits. Those are the red ones. They go fair, no one else gets out, somebody gets on base. Uh, and only 9% of the, of the strikes are hits. So none of the balls are shown. We don't know if it's a swing, you know, if an out is an out. We don't know if, it's a, if they swung at it, if it got caught, or whatever. Just the hits. Okay, so 9% are hits. And what we're going to do is we're going to move that little box. We're going to say, is there a hot spot here somewhere for hits? And conversely, if you're on defense, you'd love to know where it's cold, particularly cold. Throw it where it's really blue, deep blue, and, and people won't be able to hit it. But let's uh, say offense is, is looking at this data. Where is there a hot spot? So we're going we're gonna to move this little box around within the bigger box, like it's a cell in a, in a data brick or data cube. And inside that little box, it has two hits and 11 strikes, this, this first little box, okay? So 15% of them are hits. But we don't want to focus on the percentage because the sample could be really small. We're going to convert that to a p-value. And the p-value takes into account the sample size. Let's say you had 40% hits in a box, but that was 2 out of 5. Well, that's interesting, but not as interesting as 20 out of 50. You know, that would be really a lot of evidence. Because just one little lucky hit or not can change that from a you know, 25% to 40% uh, proportion. So you always have to worry about looking at proportions in their pure sense because it doesn't take into account the sample size. You want to, and a p-value is a nice way to convert that and use it as a score function for interestingness, but not as a probability. I mean, it's not a probability once we're doing a lot of things with it. So anyway, the, in this case, p, low p-values mean unusually red. High p-values near 1 would be equally interesting, perhaps, as unusually blue. It's harder to tell unusualness with the majority population. It's easier to tell it when you have a minority population here, like 9% red, 91% blue. Okay, so we're scoring it by the p-value, and we're going to take the one with the most extreme p-value, or in this case, the lowest, because we're looking for redness. And as we march through there, the, the number of hits and strikes will change, the percentage will change, and the p-value will change. It's a little hard visually to see because we've got a two-dimensional projection of three-dimensional data. Um, but as we're bopping along, we stumble, ah, oh, here's a good one. There's a 40%, like I just said, two out of five. Ha, it's my, I might have actually seen this chart before. Uh, two out of five are hits, and so it has a p-value of 0.06, so it's almost publishable. The typical trade, tra uh, Threshold in a, like a medical journal is 5%. So this is a 6%. So you'd be like, ah, I almost got there. Of course, I don't know what the medical journal is doing with baseball data, but anyway. Uh, so that one is, that's our leading contender so far. We pop along a little more. Wait, here's one with a third of a percent. A quarter of, a quarter of the things in that box are hits. Uh, and there's a lot of samples, 37 samples. So that one looks really interesting. It's publishable and we like it. We're going to hang on to that one. And then as we go along and try any of these different ones, uh, there was one that has particularly blue. 27 of 28 
things thrown there are, are strikes and not hits. Now, if you imagine yourself as a right-handed batter and you see that's kind of low and inside and, you know, you might be writing an article right now about how, you know, much sense that makes as that's not easy to hit. And, and whereas the, the, the one where there were a lot of hits is kind of low and outside and not too fast. So anyway, got a couple articles here. But of course, the key insight to remember is there's going to be some clustering like this no matter what. Even if the data were randomly generated, there's going to be a cluster somewhere. So what we need to do is we we're looking at the real data, find the one we're most interested in, and see how it compares to a bunch of experiments where it's fake data. But the data has to make sense physically. So when we're done zipping through it all, it turns out that only about half of that a huge cube even has data points in it. So there's only about 40 or so to try. That was our best one. Third of a percent p-value is great. All right, but now what we're going to do is we're going to create fake data. We're going to shuffle the target variable. The target variable or output variable here is whether it was a hit or not. Because I don't want to actually, I don't, I don't feel confident just randomly filling this box with data points. Because there's this, this some physics behind these balls, you know? It may be impossible to reach some of these places. It may be impossible to get a curve ball at high speed. You know, I don't know. There's so many interactions between variables that I don't want to actually change any of the input values, any of the physical characteristics of the ball. I'm just going to change its label, whether it was hit or not. So if you look at a particular spot, I'm going to shuffle it. Oh, it probably turned from red to blue if you looked at it. I'm just shuffling, shuffling, shuffling. So just doing some shuffling here, practicing, and eventually I'm going to start analyzing. Ah, okay, start to analyze. So I shuffled it. Now I went through and searched in the box, and I found the coolest spot. Yeah, or the hottest spot. So you take, if there, were, if there were, say, a thousand pitches and a hundred were hits, you would say, okay, I'm going to assign a hundred hits? Yes. Randomly to the... Randomly to that thousand. I've got the same thousand balls. Same thousand balls. I'm just changing randomly. And in that world, that's what's called the null hypothesis world, that's where chance rules. You're saying this alternative reality, these were hits. Now, if those were hits, are there any hot spots? Well, sure there are, but are those hot spots as interesting as the real hot spot or not? Actually, some of them are going to be more interesting. This is a little scary, but there's, you know, chance is so powerful <laughs> that if you do enough experiments, there's going to be some that are more interesting even though you know there's nothing behind them. There's no relationship between the input variables, where that ball is, and how whether it was hit or not, because you assigned the hit randomly. All right, so we did this experiment. This is, by the way, this is extremely high level stuff, guys. If you could follow this, you're in the you know, top one half of 1% of, of analysts around the world. So you feel great about it. Don't feel bad if you're not following it 100%, but the, the idea is to truly test whether something's interesting or not, you have to see how likely something that interesting could be created by chance. Not how likely that thing could be created by chance, but how, what would have caught your interest? What would you have thought of as your result under this, this data scenario? Well, that would have been my result. And it's weaker than the original result. It's got a higher p-value. So what we're going to do is a bunch of these experiments where we uh, shuffle the data, find the cool new, new winner, keep its score, shuffle the data again, find the new winner, keep its score, and then we're going to kind of keep track of these scores in a little histogram. So the histogram, I'll just go to 10 trials. The histogram says this is our original result, this red line here. These are ones that are better, two of them were better, and another six or so were worse. So we're going to keep track, and we're just going to run trials, 40, 50, Let's go up to 100 trials. Now, after 100 trials, it turns out that 15 are better. So 15% of the patterns that were just created by chance are more interesting. The winner amongst them uh, was more interesting than the winner amongst our real data. So what we're doing is we're learning how to calibrate and answer that question, how likely could I have found a result this interesting by chance? Well, so far it's 15%, and it turns out when we go up to about 1,000, it changes a little bit to about 18%.
And you notice that there's no formulas. You don't have any assumptions about the distribution of the data, all these things that, that cause a lot of confusion when you're trying to apply statistical ideas. You just ran a simulation. You just use this obedient, fast, reliable, and utterly dim-witted assistant called the computer. It has no common sense, so you have to set the problem up right, but then it can do it really quickly. It actually takes about a second to do this experiment. So, um, so there's a hot spot looking at one day of pitches that looks, let's call that 20%, four out of five chances that it's real. That's what we just learned. There's about one in five chance that it's just luck. So is that useful as a business insight? Yes. It's not meeting the incredibly, seemingly incredible high standards of a journal, but what do you know about the journals? They're using the wrong metric, and those standards are not nearly as high as they think. They're, they're letting in about at least 50%, maybe 90%, and we're only letting in 20%. This is a new measure to recalibrate your old measure. Use your old measure as an interestingness measure, but then do these experiments to see how often it gets beat by chance. So that's, that's, the, that's the core idea there, and y'all are now in on it, <laughs> for better or worse. You might wish you weren't, but anyway, what this kit has the capability of doing is, um, is making things much, much more reliable as a scientific result. It also means, as one person chided me when they learned about it in a workshop with a young researcher, she said, now you've made it even harder to publish. <laughs> so, sorry about that. Yeah, so if everybody else is playing by the wrong rules, they're playing by the old rules, you'll never get to publish. But eventually, I hope everybody will play by the right rules and play fair uh, and not be cheating unknowingly. It's, it's basically inadvertent fraud, most of the scientific results. So we humans will believe anything. So just being able to understand a model and saying, that makes sense. I have a great example of a colleague of mine who was helping the University of Virginia doc, uh, with a heart study. And they were analyzing data for young children, they would do a catheter to get the heart strength out. And then they said, well, maybe there's other ways. Maybe we can press the skin and see how quickly it refreshes. Maybe we can take temperature at extremities. Maybe we can take blood pressures at various places. And from that, build a model and figure out what the invasive procedure would have told us. A laudable goal. Anyway, he had, it was in the old days of overhead projectors, and he had results on the clear slides, and he had X versus Y, you know, but. As he's setting them down, the doctor and nurse are getting really excited and taking notes and making hypotheses about how this works. And after three or four variables out of the dozen or so that he was going to show, my buddy realized he was showing them up, upside down. So in other words, if, if there's a line going this way, now you flip it and the line is going down, you know, instead of this being a positive correlation, it's now a negative correlation. So he apologized, he said, reset, let's do that. And when he flipped the first one, which had a strong positive, he, it turned strongly negative, and the doctor said, that makes sense too, and started writing notes down. You know, and it's just like, and it, right in front of us, you know, and it, it can't make, this and this can't both make sense, you know, uh, but we can make sense of it. Like, we tend to tell stories to explain what we see, and we're not good judges to say, wait, that doesn't make sense. Instead, we try to explain it away. Anyway, um, and to do science, it requires being able to replicate experiments. Say, so try it again and see if you get roughly the same results. Very few of health papers are true. Um, again, 10 to 35 percent is, is the best estimate. And this techniques of cross-validation, resampling, target shuffling are ways to get rid of the placebo effect of experiments. Yes. So resampling is just the kind of the idea of, uh, of it's in the same family. Uh, it's like simulation and um, experimentation rather than like formulas. The way of, it's the best way to teach statistics, yeah. Do you, do you mean like the train and test data set or are we talking about When you do train and test and you want to do resampling, the cross-validation method is really good. So instead of choosing just one test set, 
break it into multiple chunks and use all but one chunk to train and test, yep. then swap out the test chunk, train and test again, you get a distribution of results. So statisticians, one of their great insights is, why go with the point estimate when you can get a distribution? Because you might get lucky or unlucky on that point estimate, but a distribution gives you a much better confidence about where the results are and some idea of their uncertainty. So resampling kind of does that. Great question. Sorry to add to the time there. But this is a tool that is, is easily accessible. Uh, the first time I did it, it was a program that was about 10 lines long. Uh, is an easy way to, to check some things out and avoid running with something that's just spurious. Saying, I've found this relationship between interest rates and you know, returns in the healthcare, in the health sector or whatever. Have you really? You know, I mean, it could be there, but it could be luck. How likely, given the powerful search technique that you're using and all the different things you tried, how likely is it real? So you think about an article, the article might be an iceberg, just the tip of the iceberg, and underneath is all the stuff they did that they didn't tell about. So uh, one last story on that respect. There was a, there was a medical uh, researcher in Charlottesville who, and his students, and they had published this paper, and everybody was excited about it. The company wanted to uh, replicate it. They couldn't. They were having trouble replicating it, so they hired the professor and the students, got them all to sign non-disclosure agreements, flew them to their lab, and said, what are we doing wrong? And they said, no, you're doing everything. They watched them do the experiment. You're doing everything right. Don't worry. It didn't work for us the first five times either. <laughs> there was no mention of that in the journal. Anyway, so there's just, and that wasn't thought of as doing it wrong. You know, that was just, it just wasn't thought of. So trying to make, you know, it aware that all the effort that you went into to find this needs to be taken into account. But anyway, then you can have reliable results and better, much more confidence when you actually roll something out. So thanks for putting up with me. I appreciate it. And I'd be happy to take any comments or questions if you have any. Yeah, yes. Uh, do you have any comments or observations about the presentation of COVID vaccines? Oh my gosh. That's a great question if you all heard it about COVID presentations. So uh, there was, we actually are on the record with a lot of analysis about COVID from early on. We kind of thought it was a public duty to do our best to take what a little emerging data there was and analyze it. And for instance, we looked, we used mobile data to look at where people were going and how the infection rates and so forth. And we showed that outdoor was a great place to go. You would get lower uh, infections if you went to parks and things like that. So it's just astonishing that like California shut down all their parks and their trails and their beaches and everything like that. It's just completely the wrong thing to do. Work was just as safe as staying at home. Uh, shopping wasn't. Shopping was a little, you know, more dangerous. Things like that. But you could use data to answer the question instead of just guessing. So we put a lot of that out there publicly and it looked to us like there was a whole lot. It turned into uh, political interpretations rather than scientific interpretations very quickly. So uh, that was a shame. Yes? Yes. Uh, most of the techniques, all the things I talked about today, really don't depend on powerful computing or new technologies. But some things do. There's this thing called deep learning, which is neural networks at a vast scale that wouldn't have been possible without some of the graphic computers and things like that now. And they're able to handle some, some uh, voice recognition or image recognition problems in ways that were a lot harder to do before. So this, there's been a little bit of technology impact, but not a lot. Usually the, the biggest, so most, I'm gonna say usually the biggest problem is, is software up here. Uh, the, 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 the dirty secret in data science is that five out of six projects that work in the lab are never used. Now our rate of acceptance is more like 90% rather than 17%, but industry-wide is a very, very few research projects are put into practice. And so it turns out there's this huge gap of trust and change management and so forth. You're asking somebody to make a decision about accepting a loan or not, 
a new way. And there's danger in that, or there's perceived danger in that. Whereas if you do it the way everyone else is doing, even if it's worse, at least it's the way everyone else is doing it. You're not going to... But there, I mean, I, I don't want to be blithe or minimize it. Change management is hard when it happens to you. It's really easy. You're like, why doesn't that person just see the light? But if somebody's trying, you know, if you're subject to change, it's, it's really hard. So um, the reason we have such high success rates is, well, we had to survive to stay in business, but we, we learned to partner with the person really quickly uh, from the beginning and to reduce their pain in some way to make them an ally and you know, use software to deliver it rather than an equation, you know, all sorts of little things. But um, you also don't want to come in as the arrogant, nobody likes an arrogant consultant, right? You want to come in as a humble listening person and um, because the, some of the situations people are worried about is that they're the before in a before after commercial, you know, <laughs> like, oh, what you're doing? Let me show you how to do it right. I don't even know what field it is, but I've got this black box. Yeah, so yeah, that doesn't go over well. And um, nor will it work. So it's just close partnership with the domain experts and helping them be part of the solution instead of being what's being replaced. And what, interestingly, what happens is, say you have a bunch of investigators looking at fraud or something like that, typically that team gets larger after you have an AI, artificial intelligence or machine learning assist, because they get three times more successful is the, is the typical result. Now you've got this assistant looking at everything, scoring it for you, prioritizing your workload. That's a great start compared to what you were using before, waiting on tips or whatever, randomly poking around. And they, they were able to find, for instance, at the Postal Service, U.S. Postal Service Office of Invest, Inspector General, was able to triple the amount of fraud that they were finding in the same amount of time. So what happens is that group grows. So it doesn't replace people, it actually enhances people and they get more of a mandate. Okay, you've done that, now solve this also. So it's really interesting. Even in commercial worlds, it's not a good way to reduce people, but it's a great way to increase the scope. And actually, not a good way to reduce people is a good thing, <laughs> you know, because people get to do the interesting part of their jobs. It's to let this guy do the scut work. Yeah. Wow, yeah, that would, be, that would be fascinating. I only have one experience with them, and that was helping a drug company discover a drug and then bring it to market. And uh, uh, I don't have any data on the inner workings and so forth, but there have been accusations that some of that's been political lately and things like that too, so um, that's always, it's always a shame as we, as we lose trust in institutions and so forth, but um, they, have a, they have a tough job and they desperately need the most powerful statistical tools they can, so uh, I'm, I'm hoping to get to talk to them. I've talked to a number of agencies, but I haven't gotten there yet. Yes, sorry. Mm. So, you, so you're having to extrapolate more than interpolate. Do you have any, I don't know if you've seen that or if you have any proof of that. That sounds, that sounds awesome. I, I, I hope you show me that article. I'd love to see it. But that, that makes perfect sense, yeah. Okay. As you go from three dimensions to ten dimensions, the, everything is very far apart in high dimensional space. Yeah. Especially with sparse data, it becomes very hard to actually Yeah, correlate. and almost all data is sparse when you have that high dimensions. It's, it's amazing. You had a comment. Yes. So I'm curious, just like as you think about this, that you know, often like a good idea you take too far. It's the big, biggest problems we have, and that a lot of the data to get it like the flywheel going is from statistics. But then it comes like it goes absurd. And the MBS uh, is a good example. And that mm -hmm. way, like just the and just sort of thoughts on that, and also just like all the focus on statistics without these, like we're tearing up our institutions which are much more like multidisciplinary, like as a check on some of this stuff. Mm. It's just like, just thoughts on that. Like, yeah, interesting. Um, that, 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 it's something I worry about. I think. Yeah, uh, I don't have any expertise on that particular issue, but that's a great one. It, it does remind me uh, that it's really useful to work in a group and have a group that's willing to critique one another. So 
you know, they call it psychological safety. You know, that, that's, Google studied the effectiveness of groups and they said that was one of the key results, not just the skills of people in the group, but can you say things without getting laughed at? You know, can you not hurt your career by admitting you don't know something? You know, can you, can you be yourself, be trusted, be listened to, be like, boy, groups just really work well there. And somebody won't be afraid to say, wait a minute, have you thought about survivor bias? Have you thought about what happened to the companies that aren't in the data set because they went bankrupt? And it's like, oh yeah, of course. You know, it, in, unless you have a group and you have other ideas coming at it and everyone's trying to break it. That's the thing, you, we've, we've built lots of investment models, as you can imagine, after doing well with one of them. And you know, virtually all of them fail at some point. So much better to fail in the lab than out in the real world with real money. And most of them got you know, beat up really bad in the lab and didn't make it. So that's, that's related to what you're asking. Yeah, you need that critique. And, and that's where science really thrives is in that area of transparency. There's gotten this, in the popular consciousness now, it's like, well, science says this. And you say, well, I see evidence. It's like, shut up. You know, that's not the way science works. Science works by somebody saying, well, I see a little bit of confusing evidence for this here. And we're all going to be helped by that honest dialogue, talking about facts rather than this is the consensus. Stay away, you know, because obviously big breakthroughs were done by someone who broke consensus. But then a lot of times people breaking consensus are just wrong, you know. So you kind of need to keep that dialogue going, see where the evidence is leading. Well, yes. Yes. So this, this was the stage where we used target shuffling to say, look, um, this is really significant. Now, it turns out that part of the significance is because it ran so long. You really want to be able to tell sooner than that. Um, but roughly speaking, there was like a 60% batting average. So, you know, if you said it's going to go up in the market, you'd be right 51% of the time, let's say over, over a long period of time. So in this particular sector, we were getting 60%. So that was, but that was reducing as time went on. And batting average is a crude way of doing it. Target shuffling is a little more sophisticated. But yes, it was showing that if we took a window of recent performance, not one and a half percent, but 5% of the time, it could be done by chance later, 10% of the time, you know that. So target shuffling was a way to, to eventually decide, okay, there's not enough of an edge now to still justify. What had happened was we had, such a good track record, that, and this is on a log scale, so a straight line is a constant rate of return, okay? So it's, it's exponential if you're looking at it on a normal scale, until all of a sudden it kind of flattens out. But we had been getting exponential or constant rates of return of, you know, I mean, it was averaged out to be 14% a year over 10 years, but early on it was, you know, 40, 35, 30, you know, it was, and people were using it like a checking account. They weren't thinking there was any risk in it. So, and my client, I realized in, in retrospect, had a lot of family members in there. If it went bad, his life was going to be pretty <laughs> no fun, you know, for a long time. So he was extraordinarily cautious and got us out. Clients would have still stayed in there, you know, out of, because of their history. But, the, but this was also, if you'll notice, not long after 9-11. And what would happen is the markets changed fundamentally, I think. Uh, it took a while, it took about a year for it to work its way through the markets, but the patterns that we were built on in the past weren't really holding anymore. But yeah, target shuffling was how we got out of it. That's how we got in it, and that's how we got out. Because it could tell you what your real edge is, and eventually it was not much. All right, well, thank you.